Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for our final discussion session on the National Commission to Address Racism in Nursing Report. We welcome you this evening, and we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm Dr. Daniel McKamey, the founder, CEO, and president of DMPs of Color. And who we are, our mission is to serve DMPs of color through networking, mentorship, and advocacy to increase diversity in doctoral studies, clinical practice, and leadership. Our vision is to inspire, empower, and transform the landscape of nursing to increase diversity in doctoral nursing practice. This event is being hosted by the DNPs of Color, anti, um, DEI Anti-Racism and Advocacy Committee. And I am one of the co-chairs, Dr. Vivian Pierce McDaniel. And as I mentioned before, I'm Dr. Daniel McKamey, co-chair. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Yvette Conyers, your session facilitator. Good evening, I'm Dr. Angel Daniels. I'm also your session facilitator. And our objectives tonight are to discuss the National Commission to Address Racism in Nursing Report, to engage participation in the call for public comment, to empower DOCs to be integral in discussions around racism in nursing. The purpose of these sessions is to offer an opportunity for all to share thoughts, ideas, and reactions to the National Commission to Address Racism in Nursing Report. We also felt it is important to host this space to promote awareness and encourage your participation in providing feedback on the report to the American Nurse Association. Please note that this is not a group venture. We do encourage you to please go directly to the ANA website to provide your personal thoughts and feedback. So since it's our final night, we really want to create some social media buzz. So if you would, please use your hashtags when you're talking about the event tonight. They're also posted in the chat. If you tweet, Instagram, Facebook, just please use the hashtags so that we can follow the, the buzz around this event tonight. Conversation agreements. So please, let's be open, have some open-mindedness, listen to and respect all points of view acceptance, suspend judgment as best as you can, curiosity, seek to understand rather than persuade, discovery, question assumptions, look for new insights, sincerity, speak from your heart and personal experience, brevity, go for honesty and depth, but don't go on and on and on. And our Zoom forum guidelines tonight, Please raise your hand to share a comment. Try to keep responses under 45 seconds. We wanna be able to hear from as many people as we can tonight. Please mute, camera is optional when you're not speaking. Use the chat to comment as well. And at the end of the session, network by posting your social media handles and LinkedIn links. So the format for tonight of session three, we will first discuss the racism in nursing research. We'll do a quick high level overview and then open up for 25 minutes of discussion. The second half of our discussion session will be racism in policy, same format. We'll do a quick high level overview and then open up for discussion. Again, as we mentioned before, feel free to interact in the chat and unmute yourself if you also, I'm sorry, raise your hand first then we'll unmute you so that you can offer your comments. So let's get started. So as I mentioned, the first half, we'll be discussing the research in, um, I'm sorry, racism in um, nursing research. The um, link to the document is in the chat. So you can find that to pull that up if you haven't had a chance to review it. And again, um, the purpose is to have some high level discussion. Um, so when looking at the um, racism in nursing research document, uh, they decided to approach this in a thematic discussion and really framing it around where racism shows up in nursing research. And um, in looking at the intro of the, the body of the document, one of the things that's, that stood out to me most was 
looking at a study that they had brought to life to, to, for discussion was that Hispanic nurses only represented about 6.8% in grants received while people who identified as Asian and Black people and African Americans were the lowest racial categories from 4.1% over a three year period, which underscored um, how one aspect racism, equity and health disparities are present in nursing research. So um, anyone have any response to kind of that um, particular statistic or does anyone have anything from this se section that they wanna bring to light for discussion? I think, you know, Danielle, it's important to realize, excuse me, Dr. McCammy, it's important to realize too that also in this first part, they talk about how there's increasing representation of nurses across all minority um, and underrepresented groups. But yet when you look at the study sample that you just mentioned and looked at those numbers, those numbers are not correlating to the growth that we have had in nursing in general, nor the population obviously that is reflected. For those who have their, you know, her, their doctoral degree um, or who have even applied for grants, can you share any of your experience with applying for grants being denied? Um, did you think it was related to race um, or you had race or um, so anything like that in your grant? Um, any experiences so far? I know for me, um, experiencing the, the grant process is also intimidating and, 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 um, and also feeling like I don't have access to the skills to um, do grant, which kind of um, is framed into not having um, the, um, the support or necessarily um, the encouragement to pursue grant funding. I know for me, in my experiences, um, I, like I said, I just recently learned about grants like yesterday years old, but noticing some of my cohort mates, their experiences and being put in places where they were groomed to learn about the grant writing process and the importance of getting funding for projects and initiatives. So that's been a little bit of my experience. I agree. I put in the chat too. I think it speaks to the lack of mentoring um, or lack of mentors and access that we have had. And usually you bring someone onto your grant or onto your publication or onto something you do because you have a relationship with them and you know them. Well, in this isolated realm, when you really aren't doing this in silo, it's hard to then connect with folks and feel like they want you to be part of their writing and want you to be part of their grant, even though you may be the expert in that area. Other thoughts sort of on that statistic or sort of the first part? Okay, I'll go on with um, something else that sort of stood out to me was the fact, and we talked about this a little bit yesterday, but that dismantling structural racism in Nurse and Restart starts with addressing uh, racism in nursing education. And we spent some time yesterday talking about education. And so when we look at admitting students and basing that on their SATs or their um, GREs or entry, whatever we use to entry into nursing, you can see when we talk about research and getting maybe a doctoral degree that you have to get into the nursing program and obviously to go on and to do those things. And so if there are barriers with you even getting entry to those based on SATs, GREs, other admission practices that have racism embedded in it, then it's gonna be harder to filter up to get to those um, higher degree programs. So any thoughts on what your school is doing, how you maybe were interviewed as a DMP or a PhD candidate, what that process was like for you? Please share your thoughts.
And I think just the topic of research is kind of intimidating within itself, but also like when I think about research and I think about who's doing the research, what does a nursing scientist, nursing researcher looks like that comes to mind? I know for me, I don't readily think of a person of color as a nurse scientist or nurse researcher. So that within itself is just um, highlighting the lack of diversity and then um, and like who's contributing to the body of knowledge, who's developing, um, you know, the um, developing and creating the knowledge that we're using that's informing our evidence-based practices, that's informing the pedagogy, the curriculums. Um, and so just, you know, thinking around about the lack of diversity, where the information or the science is generated and how that funnels into downstream effects is also um, interesting that this document highlight and just in real life. And to make it back on that, I'm sorry, go ahead, Dr. Pine. To make it back on that, um, you know, the document highlights that race must be recognized and treated as a sociological construct. You know, the barrier of preventing minoritized researchers to look into social determinants and other barriers is like it's almost uh, intentional to block that so we can recognize, like you said, the downstream and the midstream, but look at the importance of the upstream factors that are impacting socially disadvantaged neighborhoods and communities. Mm -hmm. Very great point. Kimberly, did you want to say something? I noticed that you have your... I did. <laughs> okay, please do. Excuse me. Uh, thank you for having me, actually. I just found out about this group today, so I was pretty excited. And I am a month away from receiving my DNP, so I'm happy about that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think I was, and I'm from Ohio, and I actually was very fortunate to have people in place who looked out that were non, or people of, of not of color, I should say. And um, I didn't receive any grants, but they still like guided me towards different places to get, um, but like I did receive the NFLP and the NEALP that are here in Ohio that are grants that are forgivable or uh, loans that are forgivable by 80%. Um, but I just happened to run into two people, one of, one of the girls in admissions and one um, of my professors who encouraged me to um, check out different things that might be available to me. And, and ironically enough, one of the, the one that was my professor ended up being the dean at the school where I'm getting my DNP, which is in a whole different state. So um, I, there are some people out there who are willing to help, but as you said, there aren't very many people of color, especially at that level. And at the school that I received my master's at, or master's from, they there were none. And there are probably, that I know of, maybe two where I'm getting my doctorate. Definitely congratulations, uh, soon coming, and um, thank you for sharing. And so it seems like for you, you had someone there who you could, who uh, was reaching out for you, looking out for you, and then um, what a coincidence, now they're the dean at the school, so your success yes. is in a good hands. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think that speaks to another theme. You talked about, you know, the funding piece and a couple of the uh, loan forgiveness program, but even speaking of research, the lack of funding towards minority researchers are huge and or having um, uh, someone on your team who is the, the first person sort of on this grant and they're white because you know that they're going to be able to really get the funding versus if you are the first person on the grant, then that may seem like uh, you're not going to get the funding. And so even being mindful of that it should not be like that, by the way, right? Um, it should not be like that at all. But those are some of the things that stood out, you know, as, as a theme as well. One of the things that stood out to me was the... Um, the devaluing hostility and microaggressions towards minor minority nurse researchers. And was just wondering if anyone out there would like to talk about that because I am currently working with someone 
who this happens to often and unfortunately it's happening to her with some of her colleagues, some of her coworkers. And they are, um, uh, you know, saying things to students like, you don't have to listen to her. So, yes. So just wondering if anyone uh, had any thoughts about that or if anyone has experienced that themselves. We have a quiet bunch tonight. I have uh, not experienced that. I'll just open up and share. I'm sorry that that person went through that. I have not experienced that, but I can imagine the, we talked a little bit about yesterday and today, you know, these type of situations then go on to create some type of moral distress or stress in general, make it hard to sort of cope with uh, when you're put up in these situations. Um, and then even we talked about yesterday, you know, the cost of racism could be your job, right, then employment, um, and then you're not employed, and then what, and this trickle down effect that can ultimately lead to other things. I think it's important to note the chat uh, that you had put in um, or Dr. Daniels put in as well. So from the document, there is an underlying perception from those who hold institutional power and privilege that minority research studies will not succeed and be impactful, which greatly affects whether the student will seek other experiences or fly under the radar to graduate. I would like to hear some thoughts on have you had to fly under the radar in your experiences? Or do you think this is true for us of color to have to take on this fly under the radar approach? Um, I haven't had to fly under the radar. I tend to be a little vocal as most nurses are, um, but I have seen this. I, I, when I worked for um, a different hospital system, people just pretty much want you to stay where, you're at, where you are, even speaking to physicians on a patient or whatever, much less once you get higher up and um, want to do more. Uh, for my project, I don't know whether I can say if it was race related or not, but it's, I seem to, di I did seem to get a little bit more um, feedback and more done before I met in person. And once I met in person, I got a lot of pushback and I never even really thought about it actually until just sitting here listening. Um, and that quote actually, um, but it was it was interesting because everyone was so excited about my project and then to all of a sudden get came to a halt like all of a sudden so um i, I think sometimes they that people think that way and what i did is just i found a different way around to to still do it and um find a different path to go and so they couldn't hold me back it was, because had they uh, not, my project was on developing uh, the protocol for a pediatric stroke nurse, because I was a stroke nurse uh, for adults and the hospital that I was at wanted to develop a, a, the position for peds. And even though I'm an adult, I was for adults, um, I still, I developed that for um, my master's degree for the adult side. So I was developing this and then all of a sudden, I couldn't come on the floor. I couldn't observe. Oh no, we stopped doing observations a long time. This is pre-COVID, pre-COVID. We stopped doing observations a long time ago. Well, is, this is something handed down by the hospital who the administrators wanted, but I couldn't get past the educator. So I went through the stroke network and got in that way. So I think sometimes um, people try to make you do that and it's up to us to find um, ways around it. 
Thank you very much for sharing, Kim. Anyone else, your experience with feeling like you had to fly under the radar before we go into sort of some strategies and next steps for us in this research world? Madeline, Madeline. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Conyers. It is, um, it's Madeline, but the way it's spelled, people say Madeline. I answer to both, so thank you, no worries. Um, I can say that my entire um, nursing career, I have been encouraged to fly under the radar. And the reason being is, um, for lack of a better term, there is a pervasive, um, there's pervasive uh, systemic racism in this former um, uh, health uh, system that I worked for. Um, I've been gone for about five years, uh, so so much so that there is still no um, person of color in a nurse management position. There is no nurse of color in a nurse educator position. There is no nurse of color in any type of um, senior or executive leadership or person of color, period. Um, despite the uh, predominance of the community that we serve is um, persons of color. Uh, so I no longer work there. Um, <laughs> and um, however, that has a, a lasting effect um, in that you are told to not be authentic, um, that your authenticity is not um, valued, yet you know, you are the, the community that they um, claim to represent. Um, so it, it does have a lasting, I can say I still struggle with that trauma. Oh, thank you for sharing, appreciate it. I think we talked about that the last couple of nights and, you know, I think we have seen that is that it does have a lasting impact. And again, this is when we talk about leaving the profession or changing jobs or, you know, um, all these things, right? And then the physical ailments that could happen because of this moral distress, um, all because of racism. So thank you for opening up and sharing. I also agree with the point about authenticity. Like, well, we want people to be authentic. We want I mean, authentic. We want people to be real, but how much of that is true, right? How, how can you truly be yourself? Or is there just a little bit where you feel like you have to hold back and truly can't because of fear of whatever may happen as well? Um, Lucia says she feels you, right? So she connects with you on that level too. And Dr. Daniels, even if you leave that trauma and self-doubt can follow you, correct? Mm -hmm. Very much so. Dr. Williams, I saw you come off of mute. I'm not sure if you had a comment or you wanted to share tonight. Please go ahead and unmute if so. Um, I was going to make a comment when we were talking about flying under the radar, you know, getting through school with your uh, research project, but I can't attribute, I think I was, I think I was um, asked to fly under the radar, but I don't think it was a racial thing. I think it had to do with the age of the people that I wanted in my study. I was doing teen adolescence and it would make it more difficult to get the um, IRB passed because I was trying to um, enroll um, adolescents talking about contraception and I didn't want parental um, consent to, to be needed. So they were trying to say, well, get the consent from the parents and then that would make it easier. And I kind of stuck to my guns as far as I didn't want parental consent because I thought that would limit, you know, but I really can't say that it was because of, um, you know, race or anything. So that was what my comment was going to be. Thank you. Um, Ophelia? Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for this forum. I am driving, so I'm sorry I can't come, come on camera. Um, but this is an important conversation I did want to just share. When I was in my DMP program, um, I proposed my project in 2017, um, my second semester. And my uh, research project proposal and ultimately um, my project and publication 
was on racism related stress and psychological resilience in black and African American nurses. And I recall doing the proposal um, and the feedback being, um, you know, this isn't nursing, this is, a, this is HR. Um, why, why do we need to have this conversation? Are we suggesting that there's racism in your hospital? Um, various comments that were discouraging and these were from my classmates. Um, and then I was, my, my professor though, was very interested in the topic. And I remember after that class, after doing my proposal, um, she pulled me aside and she asked me, she goes, you know, are you concerned? Because some of my classmates I worked with, and at that time I was a nurse manager, I'm now a nurse executive, um, but at that time I was a nurse manager. And some of my classmates worked in my same organization and were exec director or above. And she asked if I thought it would affect my employment, just proposing this as a student outside of work. She also connected me to um, a black faculty member um, saying that she thought that she would be a good guide during this process. And so I reached out to the black faculty member, um, told her about my proposal. And it was very interesting that her response was, um, don't do it don't do it, it's not, you have to ask yourself, is this student project worth you um, possibly being in trouble with your organization? Which had nothing to do with my organization. Um, so it, it is, I, I think that the, the challenges are, um, have different facets, right? In terms of not only um, white, persons, faculty, classmates, whatever, uh, not being supportive, but also even those who advise us who are of color having their own hesitancies because of racism, right? And so the black faculty member who was advising me, um, I'm sure felt that she was protecting me. Um, I pushed forward with it. Um, it I actually um, completed it. I began my research during the height of COVID um, in 2020 and completed it and um, was ended up being published in Nursing Outlook. Actually, the publication came out on the day that uh, Derek Chauvin was um, sentenced or convicted rather. Um, and it is work that I am proud of. It is about racism related stress in nurses and not in, not in terms of what they experience in hospitals, but really the idea that we are experiencing this as social stress and that it, it is a lingering um, and pervasive experience. And so the, it's about hos, hospital administration and teammates recognizing that they're black and African-American um, employees and teammates are living with this, are bringing this in with us. So not just about what happens when we're at work, but that this is our lived experience and our daily reality, and that requires a different level of support. Um, but just saying again that um, the, the, the discouragement can even manifest in forms of protection. So mm. thank you for the time. Thank you so much. De definitely look forward to, to reading that. I'll have to do a, a search um, for that article. Thank you. Dr. McKamey. Yes, and I love that she brought that up in terms of how we tend to try to protect our, ourselves, our own. I know uh, a couple of my mentors speak from their traumatic experiences in trying to guide me or quote unquote, protect me from sticking my neck out in certain areas. And uh, one area that I'm passionate about is elevating the DMP as a researcher. And I noticed that in this document, they kind of framed the nursing scientists, the nursing research and the PhD frame. And for me, being um, part of DMPs of color and having an opportunity to connect to a ton of DMPs of color and looking at their work, specifically when we had our conference that we had poster submissions, abstracts, and a lot of us are doing research style projects that are literally meeting the needs of our communities and speaking to some of the social determinants of health, some of the structural racism, 
um, like Dr. I believe Dr. Byers mentioned her project around the racial trauma. So it makes me think that we're still going to keep framing nursing science, nursing research in the PhD lens. Who's predominantly getting the PhDs? I don't know the current data, but when I think of, you know, a nursing science, like I mentioned earlier, nursing scientist, PhD prepared nurse, I don't necessarily think of a person of color, but, um, but also looking at DMPs, I guess I'm, I might be a little bit biased because I'm heavily entrenched in DMPs of color, but just my experiences of um, the work that we do, not only it's based on evidence-based uh, practice projects, QIPI, but a lot of us are doing groundbreaking work that speaks to the interests and issues of our communities. And a lot of the projects that came through our conference were around racism, implicit bias, and um, diseases that have um, manifested in our communities because of racism. So I would have loved for them to include and even consider DMPs as being part of the nursing science, nursing researcher piece. It, uh, to start framing that we, we are capable of contributing in those ways. Very much so agree. Lucia said uh, DMPs have direct observations at the bedside too. Yeah, and oversee a lot of those things that happen at the bedside in leadership positions. So, you know, we're gonna get ready and transition in a little bit to um, our you know, policy, racism and policy, but would like to hear what do you all think are next steps and strategies that we can do in this realm of racism and nursing research? What can we do? Um, I, don't, I hate to call people out, but um, I see Dr. Akintade and Dr. Ferreira. I know um, Dr. Akintade is creating a space for um, nursing researchers of color. And I don't know if he wants to speak to some of the things that he's doing. And also Dr. Ferreira too, with his work with JDMP and also being an advisory board member to DMPs of color, some of the work that's coming out around research and diversifying the research space. I guess they're being shy tonight. I know Dr. Akintade is never shy, but maybe never. he just can't get on the mute. <laughs> and Madeline did have her hand up. She put it down. There he, there he is. There he is. Hi, Danielle. And thank you for uh, putting me on the spot. Um, you know, tonight is actually one of those nights and times where I just listen, learn from people's experiences, you know. Um, uh, appreciate their, their strength and courage, you know, and, and add more tools to my toolbox, you know, as I deal with some of my challenges. So, you know, I'm, I'm really appreciative of those who have spoken earlier. Um, it's interesting. I mean, those are really challenging experiences to hear. And some of us actually hear and we have visceral experiences based on your experiences, you know, so um, we appreciate that. So Danielle did point me out for a couple of reasons. One, um, for uh, DMPs of color, I'm uh, one of the founding board members. Um, also, I'm the chair of the research committee. So this is this is a space where we're trying to not only encourage but empower um, DMPs of color you know, to add to the body of science. I mean, I, I'm, I've been privileged to sit through some of our graduations where I hear, um, you know, as we call out our role, um, all the fabulous work um, our uh, minority uh, doctoral graduates are doing. And unfortunately, um, a lot of us are just not encouraged, you know, or, or not in a position you know, to, to add our work to, to science. When Danielle was speaking earlier and she talked about, um, you know, hoping and wanting DNP work to be mentioned in science and to be a part of science, those are ex exclusive circles. Like we have to take that by force. Danielle, I mean, we're not gonna be invited to those circles, you know? So we just have to continue to working in excellence, continue to, the subject matter experts, you know, in our areas, and we have to contribute to science one way or another. 
So how how can we do that? Well, DMPs of color is is finding a way to do that. You know, so hopefully, um, before the year is over, during our next conference, we should be launching the journal for DMPs of color, and it should be JDoc, and it'll be an opportunity to um, publish. Uh, the work of minority uh, DMP students and practitioners, um, uh, and you know, obviously not not only limited to that, but you know, um, whatever continues to promote um, the clinical, academic, and leadership uh, practices of DMPs. So we're working very, very hard behind the scenes. We're paddling as fast as we can, you know, to 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 try to get that um, up the ground. So we're getting as much experience as possible. Um, it's, it's not um, good enough to put out a journal and just expect people to be able to publish, especially if they haven't gotten a lot of support in whatever programs they graduated from. You know, so um, uh, DNPs of Color is also partnering with the Jonas Foundation to put together a program um, uh, that would work with D, you know, minority DNPs who are graduates who haven't published their um, uh, DNP projects, and we'll take them through an intensive um, six-week program, Danielle, correct me? It's going to be a 12-week program, but it's a 12-week modular I, curriculum. I knew it was, okay, so it's six modules, but in, in 12 weeks. And um, our, our goal, I mean, we're, we're partnering with, um, you know, proven editors who, who have done a lot of work in this space, who are so happy to partner and support our work, uh, to work with our members, to get their work, um, you know, to a space where, where, where they can publish. Obviously, I mean, we would love them to, to submit to JDoc when it's up and going, but, you know, more than anything, we just want them to publish somewhere. You know, so we have a lot more programs, you know, down the pike, but um, those are the two I'll talk about now. And I don't know if Stephen Ferrer is here also, but I, I can also put in a plug. I mean, I'm, I'm one of the managing editors for uh, the Journal of Doctoral Nursing Practice. And um, that's another place where you can, you know, submit your manuscript, but, you know, whatever we do, um, I don't think that's that's a space that's, you know, I mean, there's still so much controversy about what we do um, in terms of, of the science of nursing, you know, and, and how DNPs feed into that. I think we have to continue to identify academic spaces where we can publish our, our, our scholarly work and um, DNPs of color. The MPs of color is also going to provide um, an opportunity for, for members and for everyone to be able to, to um, contribute. Thank you so much for contributing to this discussion. When you started talking, I felt like I was just getting a Christmas gift after Christmas gift after Christmas gift because you were just sharing so much and my heart was just uh, very, very happy to hear that. And a lot of comments um, in the chat about this is what we need. Um, we love it. You know, thank you, hand claps. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mim, for sharing some of the things that DMPs of Color are doing and um, even what we can do. That was a great, great. Dr. Ferreira. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Um, I heard my name uh, called out twice, so I figured I, I must say something. So again, thank you everyone for the space. Um, and I'm really excited about being able to collaborate uh, with the with NPs of color. Um, and this uh, pathway to publication uh, program that we're talking about is really going to uh, take a mentored approach uh, and be able to, um, you know, have the intention of, of being successful in getting a manuscript published. And, we know uh, it's not an easy process. Um, it's it's not an easy process to begin with, and there's a lot of um, uh, gray areas when it comes to uh, uh, getting manuscripts published. So we're hoping to uh, rip off the uh, the mask and really try to 
um, have some transparency and partner folks up with, uh, with someone who's been successful in this area. Um, and, you know, it's, it's work that's important. And um, I, I just look forward to trying to, you know, um, have a small role in, in, in um, getting work out there uh, published for the rest of the community to see and to be able to um, be part of the literature. And, and that's really important in, in uh, you know, any profession. And uh, that's where, where we're headed. So, um, you know, again, thank you so much for, for the space and, um, and uh, look, you know, st stay tuned. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Ferrer. Very exciting. So at this time, we are going to um, transition from our racism in nursing specific to research and focus on racism in nursing specific to policy. Dr. Pierce McDaniel. Yes, thank you so much. I just wanna thank everyone who has contributed thus far. And I am really excited about uh, um, the publication because uh, it's going to help a lot of people who are DNPs who are um, on uh, their tenure track uh, to get published. Uh, we're having we're having some um, issues, not not a lot, but some issues with that right now. So that's going to help a lot of people. So so excited about that. And of course, we are now going to talk about racism in nursing and policy, and it's my favorite subject. <laughs> Aside from history, that's my favorite. And I, I want to open it up with the definition that was used, the Merriam-Webster definition that was um, uh, definite course or method of action selected from among alternatives and in light of given conditions to guide and determine present and future decisions. And I want to, um, before I move on, I just want to give the, um, the de definition that Dr. Kendi gave, Dr. Ibram Kendi gave, defining a racist policy. He defines it as any measure that produces or sustains racial inequity between racial groups. By policy, he means written and unwritten laws, rules, procedures, processes, regulations, and guidelines that govern people. And he further notes that there is no such thing as a non-racist or race-neutral policy. And I would like to also add to that any policy that oppresses or keeps someone from achieving uh, their goals as well, uh, wherever they are working or wherever they are, um, you know, t teaching. So I want to bring about discussion on um, the question that they posed here, and how is racism showing up in? the nursing profession, how does it show up? So I would like for you to unmute your mic, raise your hand and let us know and un unmute your mic and let's have some discussion about how you see it showing up in policy. I mean, if we want to go ahead and start off with controversy, we can talk about the current climate around critical race theory. And uh, I know living in Virginia, a lot of discussions around that, which Dr. Pierce McDaniel, you're familiar with since you're right in the middle of legislative, legislative body stuff. But just thinking about the trickle down effect in um, erasing racism from history and education and how that trickled, trickles down into how um, the future 
of nurses are even aware of racism in America and how it permeates in healthcare and in nursing and how we teach, how we train and how we practice. Yes, thank you so much for that. Um, I saw that uh, Dr. Sine, is it Li Sine Livingston? Please unmute and share. There's just so much. It's a daily, it's a given and it's exhausting. I can't even imagine, you know, it's very, very hard. When you were talking about flying under the radar, the students, not to change the subject, but this applies. Um, I've had students tell me, I really want to do this, but I'm afraid that it won't, it won't go forward. So that's my role, I think, is to help things go forward and push it through. Yeah. But so many things, everything that I, my first thought was, who are the people who's working um, and they're deciding not or to keep kids in school when we had so much COVID here in, here in Oklahoma, it was horrible. And it's just now starting to decline, but that's blatant. Who do, who do they actually, or who are they worried about? They're worried about the economy. They don't care about the people that are actually working. I think that was one that jumped up first in my brain. Thank you for sharing. Yes, I, I can definitely relate to that. And to go back to Dr. McCammy, uh, when she made the statement about um, the different policies that are in place that will impact even nurses here in Virginia, because we are going through a lot right now um, with them remove, well, with them saying that they have to remove the critical race theory from even elementary schools. And um, I don't know of any elementary school that's teaching the critical race theory or, or any school here in Virginia for that matter. Uh, however, I, you know, it does impact us in the sense that if you are removing it from what comes under that is uh, even black history and teaching people about black history during black his history month. So these are unintended consequences that occur when we have these policies that we put in place. Uh, and one of the things that I was thinking about as I read this was what do we have to do to ensure that the policies don't have these unintended consequences. So would love to hear anyone's thoughts on that. Uh, Dr. Daniels, I see you wrote something here in the chat. You wanna talk about that? Yes, um, I was you know, listening and reading through the, art, the report myself. And one thing that came to mind was the uh, equitable processes. Who's at the table making these policies? Whose voice is representing um, in policy development? And you know, we talk about things that need to happen and what's being done. Um, who has the power? And you know, you really made me think of that about that when we were talking about the critical race theory being taught. And so, you know, it, it, to me, it's like the the development of that policy and having the right voices who can speak to it and represent everyone, everyone's voice, different voices. Mm -hmm. Great point. I know Dr. Conyers had, had mentioned something yeah. about, yes. I just want to also, uh, also say that when you were asking for examples, Dr. McIntosh had put in the chat about Affordable Care Act was a big um, issue when it when we talked about policy as well as voters' rights. So I wanted to acknowledge that. But the other policy too is who created the policy that you know the position of a bachelor's degree as being a requirement for entry. Right. And who did that ultimately affect? Because we know that many uh, students of color may start off in a community college like I did because it was cheaper 
and I had a six month old, you know? And so for me, going to a four year institution was not something I could have thought of. And I know I'm not the only one. And so even that policy then created more people to be um, sort of oppressed by whoever made that decision. Yes, absolutely. And um, me coming from a community college and, and especially at the age that I was when I decided to go to nursing school, you know, I definitely can also relate to that. Um, someone had said, oh, okay. Thank you, Madeline, for um, sharing that. Yeah, I think it's, I think there are many of us who did go to a community college. And in fact, uh, my, my grandson, uh, I think he had a, well, it wasn't, he didn't have a scholarship, but he was going to go to a university and then a community college said that we are going to give you a scholarship to go to our community, community college. And the only thing you have to do after that is to go into um, to our university. And uh, him being the minimalist that he is said, oh, well, yes, I'll, I'll take that. So I'm proud of my, my, my start with the community college. So anyway, um, another thing that I wanted to uh, bring about for discussion is uh, how is the development? One of the, the questions was, how is the development and Im implementation of a policy informed by uh, a broad array of stakeholders who are impacted by the policy? And I think we basically, uh, we may have answered that question already, I believe, but that was one of the things that stood out to me. And then the other thing was the, um, the statement about the code of ethics for nurses. So the nursing profession, uh, this is, uh, I'm taking this directly from the uh, report. The nursing profession is no different than many other professions, which are steeped in policies that have racist legacies or current thinking that per perpetuate decisions and actions which harms nurses of color. So the nursing professional code of ethics, if we are to follow it, calls on each of us and as a collective to practice with compassion and respect for the inherent dignity, worth and unique at attributes of every person. Promote, advocate for and protect the rights, health and safety of the patient. The one that I would like for us to look at closely, closer is um, collaborates with other health professionals and the public to protect human rights, promote human dip dip diplomacy and reduce health disparities and articulate nursing values, maintain the integrity of the profession and integrate principles of social justice and nursing and health policy. And how would one do that without eradicating racism? in nursing. You can't, that's how, <laughs> you know? And I think we think about our, you know, ANA code of ethics. And I remember just, just saying, yeah, we got these code of ethics. I really didn't look at it, honestly, like really begin to understand what the ANA code of ethics means um, until graduate school, maybe even doctorate school. And now as an educator, I break it down even more. And in my nursing research class, we talk about the code of ethics, but we talk about it from related to social justice and students' roles when you become a nurse in social justice and, um, you know, being anti-racist as, as well. But prior to that, I didn't know about it, really. I didn't look at it. Uh, you probably didn't because it probably, uh, well, I know that we talk about them and I, we've talked about them in our RN to BSN program, but I can't remember um, learning about them until I was in my uh, BSN program. However, uh, I am just, I'm saying now, when I started looking at this, we have to change these policies, but not only changing the policies, 
but we have to hold people accountable and we have to hold the um, healthcare organizations as well as the institutions of higher learning, higher education. Uh, we have to hold them accountable and we, and so how do we move forward and do that? Because accountability is everything. No. So Ellen put in the chat, it would be nice if DEI committees reviewed new policies at institutions. I said new and old policies. Um, Dr. McIntosh also shared a reference with us. Uh, Daniel Dawes has a book called Political Determinants of Health. So these are good uh, resources for us too. Um, and then Dr. Akintide said, you know, in his experience, policies are put in place that lack deep thought regarding the future impact. Many institutions institutionally racist policies were made in good faith. And after retroactive evaluation, we see they disproportionately impact people of color. We need representation at the table, intentional short, mid and long term impact, analysis and evaluation, and most importantly, the willingness and openness to evaluate and make necessary revisions as needed. Absolutely, I love mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. absolutely, yes. Anyone else have any thoughts? Dr. McIntosh um, also says, you know, we have three nurses in Congress. Who's next? Dr. Oh. McIntosh, Dr. McCamey, Dr. Yeah. Daniels, who y'all now next? Who's next? That's right. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm voting for Dr. Um, Akintati and, um, and he can have, uh, well, actually, I don't know. We will we'll have Dr. McCamey as president and uh, I'm sure Dr. Akintati will not mind being the vice to her. <laughs> I'm sure he won't. And let's see. Um, sorry about this. Uh, Dr. Sene, and again, I'm, I'm maybe saying that wrong, need to dismantle many leaders of educational institutions who are part of the good old boys, good old girls, making decisions based on precedences that have failed. I have definitely seen that. People are in positions for years and years and years, um, and they're not leaving, and it's you know continuing to cause issues. Yeah, we need to see more people on these. Um, I lost my train of thought. Um, forget it. I'm sorry. It might come back to me. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Uh, Madeline has her hand up. Oh, please speak. <laughs> you make me feel so welcome, Dr. Davis. <laughs> um, so as I was, oh, thank you. Um, as I was listening to you speak today, I recalled some of the things that you were speaking of yesterday. And, and um, you were talking about uh, programs, these educational programs and their policies for recruitment and retention. And we're seeing all of this documentation on recruitment, 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 you know, like, look at me, but how many students of color are actually completing these programs. So, you know, their, their, uh, their statistics are flawed. Um, so I would, for, for, for me, for what I think, you know, is my purpose going forward, um, my energy is going to be placed on these local programs, especially my community that is, you know, primarily a community of color here. They are putting all of this effort in accepting students of color because you don't have to take a tease, there's no entrance, you know, we'll take you, but then there are no strategies in place to address um, the educational barriers that they are encountering in nursing school because of the type of education they received in middle school and high school. So uh, for me, I think that that is where I would like to put my personal energy in this area is it's, what are you doing for our students? To, to make our community successful. So that was my piece on it. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I wanna just piggyback a little bit on Madeline. Um, <clears throat> you know, at the institution that I work, you know, at the college, uh, we spent three years trying to create a more holistic process. Uh, therefore, i.e. to diversify our student population. 
Um, and as we have done so, what we get now, and I think I said this before, but I, I'm just an advocate for this, you know, we see a higher rate, we see more um, minority students, more diverse populations, then they're pointing out the ones who are not successful are our more minority students, our populations. And right, right now, they want to go back to, let's put the standardized scores in the GPAs. So just like Madeline said, my question to them was, what resources are we offering? You know, and then the, the statement is, well, you know, how can we even test to see if these people can critically think? So you can only imagine, you know, Dr. Davis had to be Dr. Davis in that moment. <laughs> but, you know, what, what are we doing? You know, what are we offering to help all of our students be successful? That is very, very a good point. You know, there's two quotes in this that I wanted to highlight. And one of them was, as nurses, we need to unlearn much of what we thought we knew about racism and get comfortable being uncomfortable about our profession and our own way of being. We need to see nursing through a new lens and be open to what might see what we might see versus stating that racism doesn't exist. And I like that quote, but I will also say, we always talking about we need to um, get comfortable being uncomfortable. But I'm gonna say we may not get comfortable being uncomfortable. We may still be uncomfortable being uncomfortable because I think comfortability makes us feel like, okay, we're safe. But I don't know if people are ever going to get comfortable and so I'm going to say, like, let's get comfortable, uncomfortable with being uncomfortable, if y'all know where I'm trying to go with this. Like, to me, that word comfortability, I don't think many people are going to get there. And so I think we need to change up how we're saying that a little bit. I totally agree with you, Dr. Conyers. Very valid point. I agree as well. And then there is one last comment in this, uh, and we have about 10, 15 minutes left. There's one other comment in this uh, part that I really wanted to highlight too, and I'm actually gonna copy and paste this in the chat um, while I find it. But this is also an anonymous quote by someone with the listening session. And it said, why should any black nurse go back for a PhD or DMP when they will never get hired or promoted even with a DMP or PhD? And I wanna put that out there for us to discuss because many of us on here are DMPs, PhDs going for them. And what's your thoughts about this? So I, I, um, I appreciate that comment. And I, I know that probably comes from that nurses lived experiences. So um, it's, I mean, we have to take it and, and sort of appreciate it and understand, you know, feelings and emotions are real and, you know, individuals are truly entitled to them. But um, I think, I mean, those of us who are in academia who've had the opportunity, you know, to, um, I mean, we've all experienced challenges. I mean, it, it, that's for sure. I mean, I, I have my stories too. But um, I've, I've spent a lot of time in, in a mentorship space, you know, using myself as a role model to ensure that, you know, at least the people within my sphere of influence um, have similar or better opportunities than I've had. So whenever I hear stuff like that, it, it's really heartbreaking. But, you know, I think, I mean, we, 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 just like you said earlier, you know, we have to also get comfortable with being in uncomfortable spaces. Um, you know, I, I, I worked with Danielle for many years at Medgar Washington Hospital Center, you know, in the heart of Washington, DC. And I was there for almost nine years. And it wasn't until I was leaving, I realized I was the only African-American male nurse practitioner who worked there the entire nine years. It wasn't my story, it wasn't my narrative. I, I found that out on my way out. Um, I think, I mean, sometimes we, we, we may need to sort of put our heads down and sort of barrel through the wall, not just for our sake, but for those who are coming behind us. 
Because when, you know, I'm sure, I mean, whoever comes behind me will recognize that someone has been in that space and, you know, has left a, a positive impact, you know, that hopefully may impact that person's experience. Um, it, it's my place based on my experiences, lots of my successes and my challenges. And I share those readily, you know, that any nurse of any color or nationality, you know, um, should pursue their DNP or PhD if, if that's what they want, you know, because there's an opportunity. I mean, we want nurses to care for patients that look like them because we know that that improves patient outcomes. We also recognize that nurses need to see role models so they can also have better morale and have confidence, you know, while they're in nursing school and also practicing as nurses. You know, so those of us who are in a position, you know, who want to um, have to continue to push forward. So those behind us can also have people to look up to. It's not going to be easy, convenient or comfortable, like you said, you know, but that that's our responsibility at this point. Thank you so much. That is um, I am I'm, I'm there with you, uh, Dr. Bim. Thank you so much. Um, if if you know me, you know that I am a jokester. So I was, <laughs> I, I, oh, I'm sorry. Let me have, let me hear from Dr. Um, Dwayne first and then I'll. You're on. Um, hello, muted. everybody. Okay, I'm back in. Um, I just wanted to comment on that, that statement that was made as well. And I can pretty much echo Bim's um, Dr. Kende's uh, sentiments because I'm only black professor um, at my college now. And, you know, it's, I face some challenges. I can sense that people don't want me to advance. There's a lot of things that we have to do to get promoted. There's a lot of competition for certain awards. And, and when I mention um, things I want to do to progress, I get I get the funny looks and like, oh, no, you need to slow down. And and you need to take it easy, just do this. And so people still do try to pull you back. But um, I'm one of those people that, that like to shine and, and push forward and, and, and prove by example. So sometimes you have to do that no matter what obstacles you have in place. Um, you have to keep pushing forward, especially if you know you're in a minority and, and always in a state of showing improvement. So I don't let that stop me or, or give up hope just because um, I feel uncomfortable or maybe more difficult than some people. So you can do a lot with the DMP, even if you're um, black, you just have to know how to network and know how to um, get around the barriers that you may face. So, so I think that's, a, that's an option that you have to look at and never give up hope because I'm always being challenged. I'm somebody new. <laughs> I'm somebody, I'm something unusual to some people. There's some people that have not seen I have to say an intelligent black male, you're like, you're, you're strange. You're, I haven't seen people like you before. So you just have to continue to show and prove and be careful because anytime you make a mistake, they, they blow up your mistakes. So I've been there as well. Thank you so much to, for speaking to that. Thank you. Um, you know that if you have your terminal degree, PhD or DNP, you have credibility. And um, what I was about to say earlier was that I joke a lot, but seriously, any one of you, any one of you could go and become a congressperson or any other legislator and um, because you have credibility and you need to position yourselves so that you can change these policies that impact nursing practice, nursing research, nursing education, um, it, whatever in nursing, you need to position yourself so that you can um, affect these policies and, and make changes. So I would just like to hear from anyone who 
has had any, uh, I mean, we only have a few minutes, so I know I have to, um, I, I have to speed this up. But we have two hands up. Okay, well then I'll just go to the hands. All right, so I see um, Albert. Mm -hmm. And then Dr. McKamey. Okay. All right. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak on this matter. Uh, my name is um, Dr. Albert Ofori, um, and I want to echo on Dr. Janet, Janet Williams' statement that uh, she made that we should help new nurses enter into their careers. Um, I am a clinical faculty at um, Chamberlain University, and last semester, I took some of these students to clinicals and it's very appalling to know that nurses are not welcoming to student nurses. Um, I had to come up with ways and strategies to help these students learn on the unit because once you hit the unit, the nurses completely, like they upfront tell you, I don't want no students. And it's very appalling to see um, staff nurses or nurses on the floor not willing to to have student nurses follow or shadow them to learn. So uh, if we are talking about racism in nursing and also among minorities, it's very important that we touch on nurses not eating their own. Um, we will we'll have to encourage nurses to be willing to teach um, and, and, and mentor student nurses if we want to uh, take up this uh, issue. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. McCammy. I yield my time, especially since we're getting, we have one minute remaining for the, for the discussion, so. Okay, thank you. Well, I want to thank everyone for being here and, um, this was a really, really um, a great discussion tonight. And please submit your feedback. And we have the um, www.nursingworld.org. We have it, I think, in the chat, do we, Dr. McCammy? Did I we think put Dr. that in Kanye the chat? put it in there. Okay, thank you. So please, um, if you don't have time to review all of the um, reports, please select the one that you are the most passionate about. That was my charge from Dr. Grant. Uh, select the one that you are the most passionate about and make comments on that, but hopefully you will be able to comment on all of them. And again, I wanna thank you for coming tonight. And I, um, Dr. McCammon, do you have any other words? Oh, it's due on February 14th. Nope, I don't, but I, I felt like you were getting ready to encourage uh, folks around getting their doctorate and, and their credibility. So if you wanna finish your point, that was an encouraging point, feel free. Yes, I was just encouraging everyone, if you don't have your, your PhD or your DMP, please um, consider doing that. But once you have it, do not let anybody tell you that you cannot do anything. Uh, you can do everything with it. It gives you credibility. I'll tell you, I have gained more credibility after earning my DMP. When I go to Congress, when I go to General Assembly, uh, they call on me. I have um, senators uh, and um, congressmen calling on me all the time for my input. So if it's the sky's the limit. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. All right, that ends our session. Thank you again. Uh, this sessions will be uh, uploaded to our YouTube channel. So be on the lookout for the replay if you're interested in listening again. And thank you for sharing your time, your energy with us. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you.